Welcome everyone uh, to the 2024 Ben Barris Spotlight Awards Ceremony. Uh, my name is Damien Pattinson, I'm eLife's Executive Director, uh, and it's my real privilege to host this first ever event celebrating the recipients of our annual award scheme. Um, it's really fantastic to see so many of you here uh, from all around the world, um, especially those of you who have come from the eLife communities whose ongoing support over the years has been really pivotal to us running these awards since 2019. At eLife, we're committed to creating a future where a diverse global community of scientists and researchers shares open and trusted results for the benefit of all. To achieve this, we're developing a new model of publishing that puts preprints first and emphasizes public reviews and assessments of research. The model makes the sharing of research faster and fairer while still providing robust peer review and quality assessments. We're committed to ensuring that it works for everyone, not just those who have traditionally benefited from existing publishing models. And that's where the rewards being recognized today fit in. Named in memory of our late colleague and passionate advocate for more equity and inclusion in science, each year the Ben Barras Spotlight Awards represents researchers from traditionally underrepresented backgrounds who are pioneers because of their support for efforts to redefine how research is reviewed and communicated. Launched in 2019 as an eLife community initiative, the awards are a modest but concrete action to acknowledge and address the persistent biases in research publishing and funding that all too often unfairly disadvantage specific groups of researchers. So far, the Ben Barras Spotlight Award have recognized over 50 researchers from 22 countries, often in regions where research funding is very limited. Past recipients have used the awards to catalyze real and tangible advancements for their research, careers, and the communities. Since 2021, in addition to eLife authors, the awards have welcomed applications from authors of preprints that have undergone public review by a range of other preprint reviewing groups, such as pre-review and review commons. Through this change, we're proud to demonstrate our commitment to supporting a wider publishing movement that goes beyond just ourselves. This year, the sixth year of the Ben Barra Spotlight Awards, we received around 90 eligible applications from researchers based across 31 countries. Notably, more than half of those came from authors of publicly reviewed preprints, highlighting the growing influence of this new model in research communication. The high quality of those applications has made the reviewing task especially challenging this year. So during today's event, we'll formally announce and celebrate the 14 researchers who are the recipients of the 2024 Ben Barris Spotlight Awards. Among them are four winners whose applications were supported by preprints reviewed by groups other than eLife, which is the, which is the most uh, in any previous year. And, the year. and this year, the winners and runners-up also represent our most geographically varied cohort to date, spanning 13 countries between them. In addition to that, I'm pleased to say that we're joined today by our, by our guest speaker, Professor, Professor Leslie Vossall, who is Vice President and Chief Scientific Officer at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Later, we'll hear from Leslie as she shares her thoughts on the importance of improving equity and inclusion in research. And if that wasn't enough, we'll have a special tribute to honour Ben Barras and his enduring legacy. That's all to come. But before that, and before we start to reveal this year's recipients, let's take a look back on the impact of the awards to date by hearing directly from some of the researchers who have been recognised by the scheme over the past five years. So I'm Sama Sleiman. I'm an associate professor of biology at the Lebanese American University. My work focuses on identifying the molecular mechanisms through which physical exercise generates positive effects on the brain. I use the funds uh, from my work to attend the Society of Neuroscience meeting in uh, 2019. So the Ben Bars Award made a significant impact on my work. At that time, uh, Lebanon, where I currently reside, was going through an economic meltdown and resources for research, for uh, being able to attend uh, any um, conference were very limited. It also gave me the opportunity to continue working and to contribute at the time when uh, opportunities were unavailable in my country. My name is Maria Eugenia Segretin. I'm a CONICET researcher at IGEVI CONICET in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and I'm also a professor at the University of Buenos Aires. My research focuses on understanding the diversity in Argentina of the Irish famine pathogen phytophthora infestans, which causes potato late blade disease worldwide. My goal is to translate that knowledge into potato breeding programs to deploy with disease resistance in the field. I received the notification of the award while I was isolated due to COVID-19. 
I was sick away from my child and without vaccines yet, I was really afraid of what would happen. Being awarded gave me a high dose of energy to endure isolation. The award gave our project visibility in the community, highlighting the importance of plant disease studies for food security and sustainable agriculture, even gaining attention in the newspaper. We have started to build a valuable collection of isolates representative of different potato growing areas, and colleagues have begun contacting us for collaborative research projects. I am Ismail Yanuk, an associate professor in the Department of Electrical and Electronics Engineering at Hacettepe University, Turkey. First of all, the points from my award were invaluable in compensating for the extreme devaluation of our currency. Unfortunately, we do not have a startup fund in Turkey, so this award was critical for building our first experimental setup and begin data collection in a very short period of time. The funds were very important for me to build uh, my first experimental setup to study multisensory integration with zebrafish and weak electric fish. The timing of the award was fantastic for both my research and career. It allowed me to build the initial version of my experimental setup and start collecting data for my grant applications. I believe that the setup and the preliminary data played a critical role in the acceptance of my Meris Podolska Actions project from the uh, European Commission. I'm Professor Shah Ignala of the University of Johannesburg in South Africa. My research area falls under the umbrella of human anatomy. I was the recipient of the Ben Barry Spotlight Award for 2021. It allowed me to travel to Spain as well as to Turkey, where I met collaborative researchers, and this afforded me the opportunity to have a context of their research facilities and see where I could contribute further to future research. My name is Anastasia Banashak, and I'm a research professor at the National Autonomous University of Mexico and based in a very small campus located in the Mexican Caribbean that borders the Mesoamerican reef system. I am a marine biologist who studies coral reproduction. You may have seen in the news that coral reefs are in crisis. And the focus of my lab is to help in restoring coral reefs by producing baby corals from sperm and eggs that we capture in the wild. And then we outplant them once they are big enough to fend for themselves. I won the Ben Burris Spotlight Award in 2021. And the award money was used to renovate our wet lab, which is where we raise our coral babies. Receiving the award really made a huge difference for my team and for me because the renovation of our lab really motivated us to restructure it and to make our lab much more efficient and safe to work in. So I am Felipe Aguilera from the University of Concepcion in Chile. My area of research lies on developmental biology and evolution. So I have spent my award in constructing a mesocosm system to study how marine animals adapt to climate change. So by receiving this award, I actually opened a lot of um, avenues and new doors to me. And I, now I can apply to more applied research uh, funds and also international grants. Uh, my name is Ritika Sud. I work in Bangalore, India. Uh, I'm a senior scientist here at the Center for Brain and Mind uh, at the National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences. Uh, I received my Ben Barris Spotlight Award in the year 2022. Uh, our work is in the area of psychiatric genetics. Our lab uses genetics and stem cell models to try to understand the biological basis of psychiatric disorders. Winning this award has been incredibly beneficial. It's made it possible for me to bring new techniques to our lab, set up new collaborations. Uh, being in India, uh, options for us uh, to travel to other countries are extremely limited. So in that sense, getting this award was just what the doctor ordered. We, we are able to establish new techniques and uh, move our research forward in ways that wouldn't otherwise have been possible. My name is Olavo Manal. I work at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. I was a recipient of the Bimbari Spotlight Award in 2022. The award was used to initially set up the Brazilian Reproducibility Network, which is a network to bring together people and institutions in Brazil who are interested in research reproducibility. The Brazilian Reproducibility Network has grown since the award. It has grown in size, it has grown in resources. It has now received larger funding from uh, Brazilian agencies. 
Uh, so I guess the award has served as the seed for something that, that will hopefully outlast it and last for a long time. So my name is um, Nikki Crew, and I am a senior lecturer um, in the Forest and Agricultural Biotechnology Institute and the Department of Plant and Soil Sciences at the University of Pretoria. So I received my um, Ben Barris Spotlight Award in 2023. I will be using this award to take myself and my PhD student to China to attend the International Sunflower Conference this year in August. This award means a great deal to me, especially in the context of being able to experience a first international trip with my PhD student, because I really believe that travel and exposure grows a person's horizons. My name is Sophie Dipaldi. I am a postdoctoral researcher at Trinity College Dublin and an Atlantic Fellow for Equity in Brain Health at the Global Brain Health Institute in Ireland. My research aims to understand cognitive and social emotional processes in healthy people and those with neurodegenerative diseases like dementia. Importantly, my work has a special focus on underrepresented populations from Latin America who face additional challenges due to socioeconomic disadvantages and having been historically excluded from research. For me, winning this award means a lot because it is in the names of Ben Barres, who was an advocate for diversity among scientists. And I am truly committed to making science more inclusive. Together, I truly believe that having received this award will boost new opportunities for my career and my community. Thank you to everyone uh, for contributing those experiences um, and telling us about the incredible impact that these awards have had over their first five years. Okay, I'm delighted to hand over to Elizabeth Achola, who is uh, on our adver early career advisory board um, and has been involved in reviewing uh, these awards for the past three years. Uh, and also to our deputy editor, Diane Harper, who will jointly announce the runners up for this year's award. Thank you, Damien. As mentioned, this year's Ben Barry Spotlight Award saw an exceptionally high quality of applications, showcasing remarkable plans to support research career development, and community impact. While many strong applications could not be funded in full, four stood out to me and my fellow reviewers for their potential to have a transformative impact on the recipient. We are pleased to announce them as runners up with each receiving a prize of 3,500 USD to put towards their unique proposals. Our first runner up for 2024 is Evelyn Aviles. Evelyn started her research group at the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile last year after completing her postdoctoral studies in the United States. Her work focuses on understanding the molecular mechanisms of neuronal connections using retinal tissue as a model system. Reviewers praised her resilience and forward-thinking approach, acknowledging that despite her best efforts, she faced delays in receiving her mice and funding from the Chilean agency hindering her progress. Evelyn will use her award to purchase supplies to maintain mutant mouse strains, enabling her trainees to pursue parallel experiments. Reviewers highlighted the potentially catalytic effect of this work at this early stage of her lab. Our second runner up is Jose Duat, an early career group leader at the National University of Quemes in Argentina. Jose's research focuses on understanding how sleep and circadian rhythms are regulated. His group is the first at the university to work with Drosophila melanogaster as a biological model. He plans to use his award to acquire supplies for maintaining fly stocks and developing custom setups for behavioral studies. Reviewers noted the severe local funding cuts in Argentina that have hindered his progress. They recognize the potential of his proposal to benefit his research and community by using low-cost models and tools. Also based in Argentina, our third runner-up for 2024 is Kevin Alanrucci. Kevin is a PhD student at the National University of Cordoba. His award will support ecologic research into mosquito feeding patterns following earlier work published as an eLife reviewed preprint. The reviewers recognized the high quality of Kevin's proposal, which clearly emphasized his urgent need for support in light of Argentina's ongoing economic challenges. 
The reviewers also agreed that the award could be crucial to help Kevin complete his PhD research and increase the visibility of his studies into insect vectors that pose significant public health concerns. Our fourth and final runner up is Natalia Mendes from Brazil State University of Campinas. Natalia's research focuses on identifying biomarkers and therapeutic targets for obesity-related metabolic and neuroinflammatory disorders, critical areas of study given their global health implications. Her application followed her recent eLife reviewed preprint, which garnered recognition for its fundamental, significant, and compelling level of evidence. Noting the highly competitive research funding landscape in Brazil, which poses significant challenges for early career researchers like Natalia, the reviewers commended Natalia's proposal to help acquire essential lab resources as having great potential value to both her research and to her local scientific community. Thank you, Elizabeth and Diane. Uh, congratulations to uh, all of you um, for your uh, runners-up awards for the 2024 Ben Barris Spotlight Awards. Okay, it's now my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for today's award ceremony, Leslie Vossall. Leslie has been Vice President and Chief Scientific Officer at the Howard Hughes Medic Medical Institute since 2022. She's also a leader in the field of molecular neurobiology, who in parallel maintains her research laboratory at the Rockefeller University, studying how behaviors emerge from sensory input and physiological states with groundbreaking work on the Aedes aegypti mosquito. Leslie is a vocal advocate for open science and preprints and a dedicated supporter of diversity, equity, and inclusion in STEM research. Her efforts at HHMI include a strong focus on fostering inclusive mentoring and enhancing research culture. We're really honored to have Leslie with us today, and I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, insights on advancing equity and inclusion in scientific research. So Leslie, over to you. Thanks a lot, Damien. Thanks, Stuart, um, Damon, for inviting me. Um, I'm already feeling really inspired. The list of past winners, I think, really highlight what we're trying to do here, the importance of opening up science to everybody on the planet who wants to do it. So um, I'll focus my remarks on the importance of equity and inclusion in science, uh, my own personal experience um, and those of colleagues over the decades that I've been a scientist, um, and then focus specifically on our work at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. So for my entire career, I'm almost 60 years old, I have felt my entire career that the best science is done when everybody can contribute. And I really mean everybody. So diversity across all dimensions of gender, race, ethnicity, culture, religion, because the way that you look at science, the way that you look at the world brings a unique perspective and ways of seeing things. And that is absolutely key to new discoveries. So if you look back at the history of science, which began centuries ago, science was done by a tiny sliver of humanity, just like a tiny sliver of people of economic status, people of one gender and one race and one ethnic status. And of course, progress was made. Uh, but I think the 20th century has been this consistent struggle to open the doors um, to people who have been historically excluded. Um, I would say progress in gender has been stronger than in other areas, but even in opening science to women, I think that we're not even close to where we need to be. So I'm aware, again, so inspiring to see the winners from the past. Clearly, we have an international community um, as part of the program and the award winners. Of course, eLife is a major international journal. Because I work in the United States, my perspectives are going to be centered on progress in my own country here. And I am aware that experiences may differ dramatically in different countries. Um, I know there's countries on Earth where um, where women are the majority of scientists. So, and I would say in the US, this is not the case. So um, women only began to be included in significant numbers in PhD programs in biology in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, so that at the time that Ben Barris, our sort of inspiring figure, that is the namesake of this program, when Ben began his career in the 1970s at, as a woman at that time, it was still common to be the only woman in a program, you're in a classroom with 
other incoming PhD programs, PhD students, and you're the only woman in the classroom. And that, those of you who've experienced being the only, the only person of African descent in the classroom, the only person uh, of a specific ethnicity in a room, the only woman in a program, it's very isolating. It's very, feels like you're completely powerless to speak or be heard. Uh, and of course, because women, there were so few women in PhD programs, it was common to be, yay, the first woman to receive a PhD in the sciences from an institution. Of course, it's wonderful to be the first, but it's also a symptom of how women were excluded from, from these programs. So you can only be the first if there's been decades and decades of exclusion. Um, so an anecdote that Eve Martyr um, has broadly shared. So Eve Martyr is a prominent neuroscientist at Brandeis University in Waltham, Massachusetts, um, in the United States, and of course, an early leader in the founding of eLife. Uh, she shared this anecdote that in the early 1970s, even trying to get accepted to a PhD program was a huge struggle. She would apply, um, go to be interviewed, and the people running those programs would just say, nope, nope, you will just get married, you will have children, um, and you will drop out of graduate school. So we are not offering you admission. So it was incredibly demoralizing and outraging um, to be in that in that position. So uh, turning to my own experience, I'm about a generation behind Eve. Um, I've been really lucky to have amazing um, male mentors. I've only had male mentors who've been really supportive, giving me sort of my own push to keep me in science. Um, but again, starting starting uh, in labs uh, in the 80s, uh, when women were still far, few and far between, uh, I would say comments about my appearance are sort of like unwelcome, just common comments about you'll never succeed. You don't look like a scientist. Scientists don't wear dresses. Maybe you should consider wearing pants. Oh, I see you dyed your hair blonde. Nobody is going to take you seriously. Nobody took you seriously before, but people will definitely not take you seriously now that you're a blonde. You think about, you care about fashion and art. Real scientists don't care about fashion and art. So nobody will take you seriously. So not very helpful, but I have this strong internal drive to just overcome these comments. And I am a person of privilege. So my uncle Philip Dunham was a scientist. So I knew what it was like to be a scientist. I knew what it would be like to run a lab. I knew that I would overcome all of these unwelcome comments. But I could imagine that if you didn't have that privilege, but you were an amazing scientist, once someone tells you for the fifth time that you don't look like a scientist, you shouldn't be a scientist, you might start to say, actually, yeah, I want to do something else with my life. So it's it's these kinds of things where we you either explicitly or implicitly push people out of science that is the thing that we need to fight against and exclusion is an active process and so you have to push against exclusion it isn't one and done where you get some you get a woman an award or you or you get um an african american person a faculty position that we're done okay we hired one person we're done you have to constantly push against exclusion and it is pretty exhausting um, and I, I would say there's still like incredibly bad behavior out there. So, um, uh, Ben Barris would, uh, uh, ask people to share their experiences when he, when he, when he gave talks about his work, he would always pause, um, usually in the middle, not at the end, because at the end of the talk, it would be like, oh, and here's another topic. He would pause in the middle of the talk and insert a five to 10 minute segment about the plight of women in science and ask people to raise their hand. Um, have you been to a, are you a woman? Have you been to a scientific conference? Are you a woman at a scientific conference who has been sexually um, propositioned by someone? Have you been presenting your poster where a man has asked you, could you please come back to my hotel room? Kind of shocking, um, shocking that that would happen. And discouragingly, many women raise their hands. So, um, that's a very, um, I think it's not about the sexual propositioning. It's kind of about, it is about that, um, but it's also this pervasive uh, making people unwelcome, pushing against inclusion. Um, I'd say my own experience with um, with being propositioned, this was when I was not a graduate student, but um, 
sort of an associate professor sitting not at an eLife editorial board meeting, but at another editorial board of a journal that I no longer work for, where one of the other editors just kept leering at me across the table, very bizarre. And um, and then at a coffee break said, I, I just can't stop looking at you. You're so beautiful, so creepy, so horrible. Like we're peers working on this stuff. So stuff like this is really, you never forget comments like this. They sort of stick with you. And, and so, um, but my approach has always been to remain positive, not to be discouraged, try to get people to not do stuff like this, try to push against um, these issues, not only for women, but also underrepresented people coming up through science. So I would say that many programs, um, PhD programs, and have been uh, made a lot of progress. So we're close to parity or even slightly ahead. Um, and this is an amazing amount of progress over the 40 years of my career. Um, but as women move the profession, it's not as encouraging. So there hasn't really been a measurable increase in the percent of tenured women in biomedical sciences. The major prizes continue to be awarded mostly to uh, majority demographic. Of course, all deserving scientists, but when prizes are skewed, um, uh, when, the, when the juries who select um, the people are skewed, the results are also skewed. So um, again, if I turn back to, to Ben Barris, who has been just this stalwart throughout his career, the stalwart supporter of women in science, has, has put out all of these amazing um, ideas, uh, talking about um, how the tenure track system in the United States clashes with women in the, in the peak of their childbearing age. You have to perform at, at a point when you're, you're, you're at, at home um, trying to care for for young children. Um, so he has had just this outsize um, influence um, on diversity in science. So I'll, I'll speak just briefly about what we can do um, to increase um, inclusion and diversity um, and my experience at Rockefeller and then my experience um, at HHMI. So um, the first woman to be uh, tenured at Rockefeller was in Mary Beth Hatton in 1991. So that's 90 years after the founding of the university, we had our first tenured women. And when women would apply to our open faculty searches, they saw that there was very, you know, 8% of the faculty are women. And so women were not applying. And so we had to make against pushing against exclusion, make active uh, efforts to try to make the place welcoming. Um, to try to highlight that we have a daycare center, to highlight, to, to change the process by which we um, interview people, to have, uh, to make all of the faculty aware of implicit bias so that you don't make comments that make women not want to be there. And so um, about, I would say 10 years ago, about 20% of the applicants to our faculty search were 20, 20% 20 were women, and it's now closer to uh, 30 30 to 35% of the applicants are women. And so if you don't have women apply, you can't um, interview them and you can't hire them. And so there's been really, really remarkable um, progress there. So I would say racial and ethnic diversity um, in the United States has been extremely slow. We only recently hired our first um, scientist of African descent. Eric Jarvis was hired, I think, fewer than five years ago. So again, now we're 100 and 23 years into the history of the institution, we have our first black scientist. Um, and so that's unacceptable. There's too many of these amazing people experiencing being the only person in their graduate program, the only black scientist in their laboratory, the only and the first graduate um, of a degree granting program. So that's not acceptable because um, in the US, we're a, a country of immigrants. We have enormous ethnic diversity. We have amazing people who simply are not applying to programs. And then when they come to programs, uh, the lab climates can be challenging. These same kinds of comments, the thousand cuts that you face every day, the security guard asking you, um, are you, you know, why are you in this lab? When they have to show their ID to say, no, I am a student in this program. I'm not here to steal a centrifuge, right? This is a extremely and depressingly common experience that black scientists have in the United States where they are explicitly excluded. So in um, 2022, I decided to move from trying to improve the climate at Rockefeller 
to um, to sort of the national stage at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, where we have a number of programs that um, aim at uh, finding the best scientists in every community in the United States. We began with a program for college students, a summer program called the XRA program. We have current programs like the Gilliam Fellows Program, which pairs PhD students with, with PhD mentors who care about diversity, equity, and inclusion. We have the Hannah Gray Fellows Program with the explicit goal of uh, increasing the diversity of uh, the professoriate. And so we have 105 Hannah Gray Fellows out there. 40 of them are already members of faculty. They're already faculty. And so this program, it's kind of like a shortcut for all of the faculty searches out there. It's like, we will find amazing, diverse people and you will just hire them. And so the Hannah Gray Fellows are this brilliant idea from my boss, Aaron O'Shea, that we pick amazing early career faculty, build cohorts, encourage them. And these people have been pushed out to institutions across the US where they are building diverse, happy labs that increase um, inclusion. We recently launched the Freeman Rabowski Scholars Program, which is also an early career program, but making significant investments. This is a $1.5 billion US program with the idea of finding outstanding scientists who recognize the importance of equity and inclusion, have them build happy and diverse labs to, again, use this as a nucleus to, to create the next generation of scientists. Uh, and again, uh, active programs to make the lab cultures healthy. Um, and so I just wanna uh, finish by saying how wonderful it is that this Ben Barris Award exists. It's, um, uh, he would be so delighted, Ben, would be so delighted to see um, the faces and the words um, and the images of these award winners. It's it's so inspiring and it's so important that all of these people, all of the awardees will be able to put on their CV, I am a Ben Barra Spotlight Award winner. My work is celebrated. I belong. I am included. Um, and it also amplifies all of the messages. The lifetime message of Ben Barris is one of the handful of transgender scientists in the world to bring um, equity and inclusion to the center of, of science. And so I thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Leslie, for that um, amazing and very powerful talk. Okay, I'm now delighted to uh, hand over to our um, eLife co-editor-in-chief, Tim Behrens, um, and back to Elizabeth Ochola for um, the first half of this year's winners. Thanks, Damien. Um, it's now my privilege to join Elizabeth in announcing the first five of our 10 winners for the 2024 Ben Barris Spotlight Awards. These are the researchers who, as deemed by this year's reviewers, most demonstrated the greatest promise for an award to have a transformative impact on their research, careers, or communities. Many of the proposals were particularly commended for their potential to promote a healthier research culture by increasing openness, re reproducibility, inclusiveness, or collaboration with, within the recipient's research. Each winner will receive up to $5,000 according to their individual needs. Our first winner for 24 is Aisha Riaz. Aisha is an early career group leader at the University of Karachi and the first ever recipient of the Ben Burris Spotlight Awards based in Pakistan. Aisha's research with fruit flies aims to shed light on diseases like diabetic neuropathy and neurodegenerative conditions. The reviewers highlighted Aisha's proposal based on her preprint evaluated by our pre-review as particularly compelling amongst those who received this year. They emphasized her critical need for funding to introduce fluorescence microscopy techniques into her lab and praised its potential to benefit local researchers through collaborations. Our second winner for 2024 is Hamana Bankone from the Shoklo Malaria Research Unit in Thailand which provides quality healthcare to marginalized populations along the Thai-Myanmar border. The award reviewers commended Hamana's proposal as well justified, highlighting its potential to overcome barriers and unlock transformative opportunities for her clinical research. Her award will support a trip to Singapore to join a collaborator and use their microfluidic systems for investigating underlying disease mechanisms and prognostic markers. The reviewers also recognize the potential for this collaboration to positively impact some of the world's most vulnerable populations. 
Our next winner is Joaquin Gonzalez, the scheme's first ever winner based in Uruguay. Joaquin uses diverse computational tools to understand how neuronal populations drive behavior, often utilizing well-curated, publicly available open data sets. The reviewers noted the funding challenges for early career reviewers with non-traditional approaches and saw the awards potential to support Joaquin at a pivotal career stage. Joaquin will use the award to visit New York University to collaborate with the local neuroscience community there. Our next winner for 2024 is Maruf Baghdadi. Maruf is currently a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Biology of Aging in Germany. His application followed a 2023 preprint, which public evaluations organized via Review Commons commended for its interesting and promising approach. Maruf's award will fund the generation of an mRNA sequencing dataset to validate results of his studies into biomarkers of healthy aging. The reviewers recognized that this could not only improve the reproducibility of Maruf's research, but also serve as a preliminary data to help launch the next independent phase of his career. Our next winner is Nso Anabira, the first researcher in Ghana to receive a Ben Burris Spotlight Award. In 2022, he published an eLife paper reporting a new assay to assess antibody cross-reactivity at the single cell level. And so, will now use his funds to purchase molecular biology equipment to support research training at his university, as well as to support his own travel to France to conduct assays in his mentor's lab. The reviewers noted a clear need for funding to overcome significant barriers and highlighted the potential for transformative impact on Nsoa's research and career. Fantastic. Thank you, Tim and Elizabeth, uh, and congratulations uh, to all um, five, uh, the first five, I should say, of our, of our 10 winners. Um, really amazing to hear the work you're doing. Uh, okay, before we announce the next five, we will um, take a moment to honor the individual for whom these awards are named. Ben Barres serves as an eLife reviewing editor from 2015 to 2016, but stepped down following his diagnosis with pancreatic cancer, which sadly claimed his life in 2017. While I didn't have the opportunity to know Ben personally, as this was before my time here, he had a profound impact on eLife and, and the scientific community more broadly. Colleagues remember him not just for his scientific brilliance, but also for his passionate advocacy shaped by his unique experiences as a transgender man. Ben was always one to challenge the status quo and be tirelessly advocated for greater equality in science, which is why these awards bear his name. I'd like to invite you to uh, watch a video uh, in tribute of Ben's life, uh, which, have been, we've, which we have been graciously given the permission to screen during this event by the two-time Emmy-nominated and award-winning filmmaker, Pamela Green. Since the time I could have any conception of what science was, I was interested in it. Anything I could get my hands on, chemistry kits, solving puzzles and figuring out things, understanding things about nature. I was really a tomboy. I wanted to dress like a boy. I wanted to do the things boys do. Barbara was impressive. She spent her summers during high school working with computers at Bell Labs. One of the largest and most experienced industrial laboratories in the world, staffed by scientists, engineers, seeking new knowledge and new understanding. She was friendly, extremely bright, opinionated, very energetic, and had a curiosity that could not be satisfied. When I went to college at MIT, I was interested in electrical engineering, artificial intelligence, a lot of hacking on computers. There weren't very many women. They were not treated the same as men, and the presumption of some of the professors there was that women were simply not capable of the same level of science. In artificial intelligence class, the professor assigned a tough problem to see if anyone could solve it. She came up with a solution, and he doubted her solution because her boyfriend was a math major. More likely that he solved it. She was treated in a way that didn't make sense to her, how women would be singled out, and that infuriated her. These are extremely basic questions. I took a course from Hans Lucas Teuber, who studied brain-injured patients in the war actually decided at that point to become a neurologist. 
in medical school, every day life was awkward and just always just sort of feeling uncomfortable. I didn't feel good about myself. I didn't like the way I looked. I looked wrong. I didn't feel like I should have breasts. Although it was useful to be a neurologist and that I could help patients, many, many conditions don't have treatments. And so I wanted to go to the lab bench and start to do work to help develop new treatments. After doing the full residency in neurology, she took the very unusual step of starting again at Harvard and decided to get a PhD in neurobiology. The thing that characterizes Barbara is passion. She was so completely dedicated to science in studying the brain. For the most part, people had focused on the neurons, but there are actually more glial cells than neurons. Glia means glue, so they were thought to be cells that just glued together the rest of the brain, and they had been almost completely neglected. So right away, lights are flashing on glial cells. She discovered electrical characteristics that were just overwhelmingly new. Discovering that glial cells have electrical activity meant that glia seemed to have a function. There's half or more than half the brain cells that have been untapped. It really does open an entire world for neurological diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson. Psychiatric disease of as a graduate student and then as a postdoc, she made a whole series of discoveries and really transformed an entire field. She became internationally well-known. This went on and on and on when she started her own lab at Stanford. She and her colleagues showing how important glial cells are for the development and function of nerve cells. I really enjoy the science that I do, but sort of was confronted with this gender confusion. It was just this uncomfortable feeling. I'm different, I'm different. I was only reading a newspaper article one day about a female to male transsexual that something clicked. And I said, oh my God, this person sounds just like me. Paris revolutionized the way neuroscientists think about glial cells. Many of you probably know that I'm transgender, so when I arrived at Stanford, I was Barbara. I didn't dress like this for work, typically. <laughs> okay. It's been really fun to work with young people in my lab and work as a team and think about how we might develop new therapies. Each presentation starts with a question. You really had a great way on having us understand the big picture idea. He's sort of a magnetic, infectiously enthusiastic human. He was a tree, and he recognized that science Scientists coming out of his lab would be branches from that tree. Hundreds of labs around the world now that research glia. He played a major role in ensuring that was possible. It was just a relentless onslaught of discoveries that were beyond, I think, even his wildest dreams. Glia are the P towards new therapeutic strategies for neurodegenerative and other brain diseases that have been largely untractable up till now. As a result of being transgender, I've lived Life is the same person, first female, and then male. It's made me very aware and frankly very angry about the many barriers that talented women still face in every profession, not just science. I like to just talk about this for a little bit because it's one of my favorite subjects after Glia. Not many people who are that kind of scientist become serious activists. He did it in order to help all women in science, anybody who was disadvantaged. For many students who are gay, who are still closeted, for fear of harmful repercussions to their lives and careers, I always advise them to be open about who they are. Your difference is your greatest advantage. Don't let others take your happiness away. He became a champion for all of those people. If we want to be successful in science, we need these diverse perspectives. He changed policy. He changed things in a way longer term than we could imagine, and we didn't even appreciate it at the time. Thank you so much for your continued commitment to promoting women. I can say personally that you have made an impact to not only my life, but many other people's lives. And what could be more interesting than trying to understand how our brains develop and how we think? Basically, that makes us uniquely human. I mean, it's just incredible to be able to ask questions and be able to, to try to solve them. The video we just watched supports an ongoing project to bring Ben's inspiring story to the big screen. If you'd like to learn more or to support the project with a donation, uh, you can do so by visiting askthequestionmovie.com. That's uh, askthequestionmovie.com. Okay, as we reflect on the significance of today's events, I'm humbled to be able to share a personal message from Ben's twin sister, Jean. 
Although Jean was sadly unable to be with us today, she's kindly sent the following reflections and words of encouragement, which I'll now read on her behalf. It was special to be Ben's twin sister. We were always so different. I was interested in Barbie dolls and sewing and knew from a young age what I want, that I wanted to be a nurse. Ben, on the other hand, had always been interested in science, but didn't realize he wanted to be a physician until he was in college. It then took many years of intense study at universities, both at home and abroad, as well as completing a residency and practicing neurology before Ben took a professorship at Stanford. Ben always loved learning and research and his passion for science and the pursuit of answers was greater than anyone I've ever met. Science and research were his life. Ben's students and colleagues were his family. I always thought that I would get to know Ben more when he retired, but sadly that didn't occur. What I do know and what I'm proud of is how deeply he cared about helping others succeed. His advocacy for women and the LGBTQ community helped many, many to progress in their research careers. He was fearless in his quest for equal opportunity for all. And perhaps more importantly, he was a wonderful mentor to so many students and continue to adv advance science today. It's very meaningful to me that eLife can provide these wonderful awards in Ben's name to help support the work and careers of talented researchers around the world, who I know Ben would have wanted to see succeed as well. Right, in that spirit, I'm pleased to hand back to uh, Tim Behrens, uh, this time with uh, eLife Deputy Editor Yamini Dalal, uh, who will announce the final five winners being recognized through this year's Ben Barris Spotlight Awards. Um, thank you, Damien. Um, that was a really wonderful tribute. Uh, it's now my turn to say that I'm delighted and honored to jointly announce the final five 2024 winners of the Ben Barris Spotlight Awards. As before, these outstanding researchers will receive up to $5,000 each to support their research, their careers, and their communities. Our sixth winner for 2024 is Ose Rahman Asadionio Shadrach from the University of Abuja in Nigeria. Aseraman's research focuses on metabolic markers of prostate cancer in Nigerian men, aiming to understand tumor pathobiology and identify therapeutic targets. The reviewers recognize Aseraman's urgent need for support, which is unmet via other channels. They also highlighted his award's potential to advance equity in biomedicine by supporting a currently underserved, underserved population in cancer research. His award will allow him to conduct uh, metabolic analysis using NMR spectroscopy in South Africa because such facilities are unavailable in Nigeria. Our next winner is Ren Ujimatsu, a PhD student at the University of Tokyo and the scheme's first recipient in Japan. Ren investigates how beneficial fungi transform into pathogens with a focus on the gene BOT6, as explored in her recent preprint that was evaluated by pre-review. Ren's award was partially given uh, to alleviate travel barriers caused by the yen's low value, facilitating crucial collaborations. Specifically, Ren will use her Ben Barris Spotlight Award to, to fund some costly but crucial lab experiments and to visit a collaborator in Spain to learn about genetic analysis of Fusarium fungi. Our next winner is Shayanti Acharya, a PhD student at the IIS in Bangalore. Shianti recently co-authored a reviewed preprint on mechanosensing in the immune system, highlighted by the peer reviewers as a valuable study. The reviewers commended her well-founded proposal to address barriers to her research and to support new collaborations. Shianti now plans to use her award to explore immunosuppression in ovarian cancer models and present her findings in an international cancer immunotherapy conference in Canada next year. Our next winner is Valerie Tornini, an early career group leader at the University of California, Los Angeles. Her group's research explores how chromatin regulators and micropeptides shape vertebrae cell gene networks. Valerie will use her funds to travel to Uruguay to establish collaborations with local developmental biologists. The reviewers also recognize the potential for additional community impact of this trip, which Valerie has planned to coincide with a major annual outreach event promoting girls' involvement in science. Our 10th and final winner is Victoria, Victoria uh, Sabatien at the University of Kinshasa and Kinshasa School of Public Health. Victoria is the first recipient of the Ben Barra Spotlight Award based in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. This 2023 preprint reviewed by Gigabyte mapped the spread of two mosquito species within the city of Kinshasa. His award will fund laboratory equipment and research consumables for testing plant-based larvicides. 
The reviewers highlighted how Victoria's funding request, though modest, could significantly advance research on new tools to control malaria mosquitoes within his local context. Okay, thank you, Yamini and Tim, and congratulations uh, once again to all 10 winners um, and four runners up for this year. Um, we, yeah, we look forward to seeing how uh, the impact of the awards um, will uh, impact your research and careers in the future. Okay, we're nearly at the end. Um, as I prepare to close the ceremony, I wanted to acknowledge some of the many people who need to be thanked. Uh, first of all, I'd like to extend a uh, heartfelt thanks to our guest speakers and everyone who's contributed to the, to the success of today's ceremony. A special thank you goes to my colleagues behind the scenes who make the awards happen every year, particularly our communities team who has overseen the running of these awards on behalf of eLife and our marketing and communications team who help ensure that we receive such an incredible, incredible pool of applicants each year. I'd like to give a particular mention to Dr. Stuart King. Stuart actually leaves eLife on Friday after 10 years, um, and he has, uh, he's moving to a position uh, to oversee research culture at the University of Loughborough. So I wanted to personally thank him for everything he's done for us over the years, and that these awards are really an incredible legacy uh, that you leave. So thank you, Stuart. Uh, thanks also to our partners and, our, and other organizations who are reviewing preprints publicly for promoting these awards and helping to advance the movement. Our gratitude extends to eLife's communities, particularly our editors and the members of the Early Career Advisory Group who generously review applications and help serve to select the winners each year. And lastly, thanks most of all to all of you for joining us for the celebrations today. If you'd like to find out more um, about this year's recip recipients, uh, we'll be sharing a link to the announcement that will uh, shortly go live on the eLife website. And uh, will it be shared here, Stuart, or um, just the... Just the website, okay, right. Uh, and um, we'll also share a link uh, to the uh, recording of today's events. Um, to learn more about the awards in general and other community initiatives that we have at eLife, we recommend visiting the community page of eLife website, uh, where you can also join our monthly community newsletter and find out um, about other opportunities and other things that we're doing in the research community space. Thank you again. It's been a real pleasure to, uh, to host these awards. Thank you to Leslie. Thank you to all our um, panelists. And thank you for, um, for you all for participating. And we'll see you soon. Goodbye. Congratulations. Congrats. Yeah, fantastic. Amazing. Congratulations to everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.